Some have said that liars make poor martyrs. The apostles were willing to suffer and die for their belief in Jesus' resurrection. This shows that, at the very least, they were sincere. Sure, there are martyrs in other faiths, but what sets apostolic martyrdom apart was that they died for what they said they saw firsthand. But have Christian apologists overstated their case? Skeptics like popular YouTuber Pelogia says that they have. Big time. I'll get to a summary of Paul's objections in a moment, but first let's look at the evidence. For starters, the Jewish leaders had Jesus crucified. What warm greeting could the disciples expect from them? The apostles had to contend with prejudice backed by power, and yet according to Acts, the apostles had some serious brass. They blamed the Jewish leadership for carrying out a judicial murder of Jesus, and they preached Jesus' resurrection in the streets of Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to preface that I'm not assuming that the book of Acts is reliable, but it is something that I'll definitely argue for in future videos. Second, we know that many of the Jews didn't view the Christians as just another sect of Judaism, but as dangerous heretics. They rejected the temple, the sacrifice, and a belief in a conquering Messiah. They changed the normal day of the Sabbath to the day that they claimed Jesus rose. It's likely that for these reasons, Paul persecuted them from town to town before converting himself. The Romans weren't fans of Christians either. Tacitus tells us that Nero blamed the Christians for starting the fire in Rome in AD 64. Why were they scapegoated? Most likely because their beliefs were already unpopular in the city. Tacitus said that they were superstitious, practiced abominations, and hated the human race. Lucian, Suetonius, and Pliny the Younger later echo similar disdain. The book of Acts tells us that Christianity was a threat to the business of idolatry. Christianity wasn't content to simply add Jesus to the pantheon. They preached that a Jewish peasant that was crucified in Jerusalem was Lord of all, and all other gods are false. The proof of this was the resurrection. Paul said there was no Christianity without it. We also have confirmation of this anti-Christian attitude in the New Testament writings. Hebrews talks about the imprisonment and property confiscation of Jewish Christians, and the focus of the letter is to show that Christians shouldn't go back to Judaism to avoid persecution. First Peter is also encouraging the churches in Asia Minor to endure persecution, and Revelation makes clear allusions to martyrdom and suffering too. Paul also writes to encourage the Corinthian, Roman, Philippian, and Thessalonican believers. In various ways, he tells them to keep the faith in the face of persecution. He writes in 1 Thessalonians 2.14, For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things that those churches suffered from the Jews. This shows that the young church was being persecuted by both Jew and Gentile. Paul goes on to talk about his own experience of being beaten with rods, whipped, stoned, and more. In his letter to the Corinthians, he said the apostles were like those condemned to die in the arena. We know that Paul was familiar with some of the other apostles. This indicates that they were enduring similar suffering. In the four Gospels, Jesus also predicts the future suffering of the apostles. Whether you think Jesus didn't actually prophesy these things doesn't really matter here. If these were words put into his mouth, it would be because they were things that actually happened. If he said them and it didn't happen, chances are the Gospel authors would omit it. Finally, the book of Acts records the arrest and beating of the Twelve, the stoning of Stephen, the killing of James, the son of Zebedee, by Herod Agrippa, the arrest of Peter, and the sufferings of Paul. One last thing, if the early apostles recanted, it would have been catastrophic for the church. When management starts dumping company stock, workers don't usually put their life savings into it. But instead, we find churches willingly suffering for their beliefs, we don't find any epistles dealing with any sort of damage control. And surely early critics of Christianity like Kelsis would have pounced on it if they had any record of it. Put these things together and I think the conclusion is rather simple. The disciples were willing to risk their necks and preach the resurrection of Jesus. Now let's look at four specific examples of actual martyrdom. Two first century sources attest to Peter's martyrdom. John 21, 18-19 reads, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So here Jesus predicts that Peter will die a martyr's death. Most scholars date John's gospel to the late first century, long after Peter died. Whether Jesus actually spoke these words or not isn't the issue here. I doubt John would have attributed this prophecy to Jesus if Peter's martyrdom actually didn't happen. Second, we have the letter of Clement of Rome, which tells us about the deaths of Peter and Paul. Irenaeus tells us that Clement knew some of the apostles, so he'd be in a good spot to know. Also, Clement wrote to the church of Corinth, which had a history with both apostles. Scholars date the letter to around 95 AD, so we have some pretty strong early attestation. Clement of Alexandria, Ignatius, and Tertullian also connect Clement to Peter and or the letter of First Clement, so it's more probable than not that these traditions are reliable. We also have the letter from Polycarp dated to around 110 AD. Irenaeus said Polycarp was a student of the Apostle John. Polycarp also mentions the martyrdom of Paul and Peter. So here we have two very early traditions of the martyrdom of Peter and Paul. 
The book of Acts tells us the fate of James, the son of Zebedee, as mentioned earlier. And there's also Jesus' brother James, who the Jewish leaders had stoned, according to Josephus. According to the account, the high priest Adanus had James stoned to death in around 62 AD. The Gospels recorded that Jesus' own family was very skeptical of his claims, but he later converted after Jesus appeared to him after his death, so this piece of evidence is very significant. Okay, so now it's time to let the critics speak. Here's Pologia. And before we get too far... I think it's fair to remind everyone of my criteria for martyrdom for resurrected Jesus. First, the person claimed to have witnessed resurrected Jesus. Second, the person had a chance to save their lives by recanting. And third, rather than recant, they chose to die. That seems pretty basic, right? I go into all of the detailed evidence presented in significantly greater detail in a video called Did Disciples Die? Saying Jesus Rose in response to Mike Winger that I'll link above and in the description. Okay, we're ready. Bring on the good evidence. Take James, the brother of Jesus, for example. There's an account from Josephus, a Jewish writer, at the end of the first century. And in that account, we learn that a high priest called Ananus had a bad temper and some kind of personal grudge against James. One day, when the procurator was out of town, Ananus took the opportunity to fabricate some charges against James and have him stoned to death. That's not the kind of situation where James would have been given a chance to recant. It was a political murder, not ideological, not a martyrdom. Take James, the brother of John. There's an evidence, a recording of his death in Acts 12:2, at the hands of Herod. King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. That's the whole story. Doesn't sound like Herod cared about his specific beliefs at all. And there are multiple pieces of evidence, different documents, pointing out from the 1st and 2nd century that both Peter and Paul died as martyrs. Since Sean is compressing the nuance of his most complicated historical argument into a single sentence, I'll point you to my Did Disciples Die Saying Jesus Rose video for my full treatment on it, but leave you with the highlights that the multiple different documents are highly problematic in that none of them agree with each other on even the smallest detail and come from the same kind of sources Sean earlier dismissed as apocryphal. Even if we are charitable to all of it, Peter and Paul died under Nero, whom we're led to believe wanted to kill Christians as a cover for his own crime of arson, not because he cared in the least about their ideology, and no opportunities to recant are recorded. And there is no evidence that any of the apostles recanted their beliefs. But as I was just saying, there's no evidence of any of the apostles being given an opportunity to recant. So we're basically at an impasse on this one. But you also can't argue they died for their beliefs without establishing that the reason they died was their beliefs. Paul's point is very well taken, and this is good feedback for the apologetic community. We shouldn't overstate the case. We don't have a record of the apostles having the chance to recant, but refusing to do so. Fair enough. But because something doesn't deductively necessitate a conclusion doesn't mean that it's totally worthless. To say otherwise would just be bad epistemology. We have evidence to support a conclusion as very likely without necessarily establishing it. And that's still valuable, which is why I laid out all this background information. I'll illustrate this kind of black and white thinking that Paul has. In a response to Mike Winger, here's how he interprets the death of Peter. But it's not clear that this death would have to do with stretching his hands. Verse 18 is talking about putting on clothes. When Peter is old, he'll need to stretch out his hands so that another person can put clothes on him. Maybe it's the carrying him where he doesn't want to go is the death part. Maybe Peter is set out to sea on an iceberg. Frankly, being old and dressed by someone else and being led around where you don't want to go sounds much more like a nursing home than a crucifixion. Christians may like to affirm it, but the stretch death is a bit of a stretch. I find Paul's interpretation of John to be very strange indeed. How exactly would a Grandpa Simpson death in a nursing home glorify God? I could be mistaken here, but Paul's problem seems to be that if something isn't perfectly spelled out, a reasonable inference is just completely illegitimate. And I find that to be really strange. If my wife said, the kids are going to make some delicious snacks, I'll assume she means they're making food. I'm not going to say, hey, do you mean that you plan on eating the kids someday? So sure, Paul's right. John could be interpreted differently, but 
Why should we think that? Furthermore, he's correct that there's more that we would like to know about the fate of the apostles. We don't have an eyewitness account that says Peter was crucified upside down or that Thomas was killed by Spears. But with all we know, we can say with a lot of confidence that, as William Paley put it, that the apostles passed their lives in labors, dangers, and sufferings, voluntarily undergone an attestation of the accounts for which they delivered, and solely in consequence of their belief in those accounts, and that they also submitted to the same motives to new rules of conduct. So maybe we don't say that they all willingly suffered and were martyred with 100% certainty, but are we going to say that the chances of their willingness to die is low based on our background knowledge? To say that they didn't willingly suffer for their message lacks plausibility, and historians rarely deal in certainties anyway. I find this very odd because elsewhere, Apologia is okay with offering up speculative, psychoanalytical scenarios about how Peter and Paul and the other apostles came to believe in the resurrection in the first place. Now, he's perfectly welcome to do that, but there appears to be some inconsistency going on here. Finally, Paul seems to be saying that willingness to suffer is not good enough to indicate strong sincerity. Here's Apologia again. Let's take another look at the resurrection argument syllogism, replacing dying with willing to suffer, and see how we do. Wait, does that first one look right to you? People who are willing to suffer are sincere? Are they? What does willing to suffer even mean in this context? I mean, is willing to suffer basically knowledge that the consequences of one's actions could potentially lead to suffering? Would you say that a thief who is aware of the law is willing to go to jail? Would you say that a smoker who is aware of the risks is willing to get lung cancer? Not at all. People take risks all the time, hoping to be in the group that avoids the negative consequences. The whole gravitas of the apostle martyr stories with the grisly details is that the finality of violent death was supposed to be the security of the sincerity. I've been binging forensic files on Netflix recently, and all of those murderers thought that they would escape charges. And only once they are caught and at the point of facing life in prison or the death penalty would they then change their tune in order to save themselves. When Sean's years of investigation into these martyr claims turned up unconvincing, the weight of the argument went with it. This willing-to-suffer version doesn't do much to establish sincerity. So did the apostles hope their preaching didn't catch up with them? We need to remember our background knowledge. Jesus was already crucified, the early church was already viewed by the Jews and Romans with great hostility, and according to Acts, they were already arrested and beaten, and Stephen and James were killed early on. Every time the apostles taught, they knowingly risked suffering and death, but they continued to preach the risen Jesus. For Paul to appeal to the eyewitness account of the Twelve, they'd have to actively still be preaching. Given the active proclamation of Christ and their full awareness of the cost, comparing this to a smoker or a criminal who hopes that one day things don't catch up with them is kind of absurd. So how do we know the difference? Those who risk suffering for thefts and murders but hope not to get caught are seeking earthly rewards. The reason we know the apostles were willing to risk their necks is because Jesus' resurrection guaranteed their own. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Why are we in danger every hour? If from human motives I fought wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Here's the bottom line. No, we don't have an eyewitness account of their refusal to recant, but we're on solid ground to make some reasonable inferences about their sincerity. This is just one part of the case of the resurrection. I think Paul G and I would agree that the more important question is how they came to believe it in the first place. Overall, I think Apologia has given apologists a good reason to be careful to not overstate their case, but we don't want to undersell it as Paul does either. Music